What does it look like to be a five-star employee? And what does it look like to hire five-star employees? And how can we get those kind of people working with us so that we're profitable and we're enjoying life? Today with Danielle Mulvey, we answer that question. Welcome to Advance with Mike Acker, the podcast designed to help entrepreneurs, business leaders, and professionals alike break through barriers by improving their practical leadership skills and increasing confidence in speaking. Your host is a best-selling author, executive coach, and founder of the Advance Public Speaking School and Advantage Publishing Group, two companies dedicated to providing an edge for leaders. Find out more about Mike at mikeacker.com. Now here's your host, Mike Acker. Danielle, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here with us today. Awesome. Thank you for having me, Mike. Let's dive into a question right away. A lot of the people that I am that I am talking with on my podcast and on YouTube are either entrepreneurs or they're entertaining the idea of being an entrepreneur. They're a manager, they're a CEO, they want to start something new, whether it's a traditional route or just kind of bootstrapping it. They're thinking about being an entrepreneur. So let's ask this question right here. What is the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make when hiring their first few significant hires? Yeah. So I think the first mistake that they make is that um, they take everything that they don't want to do or they're not good at, and they try to make it one job for a new hire. And so what they're effectively doing is trying to find a sparkly rainbow unicorn um, in that role. And what you're better off doing is you're better off piecing apart those things that you need. So typically the first hire an entrepreneur makes is someone who they call an admin. And this person, I'm sorry, really doesn't exist. This super admin that they're looking for is probably someone that they're expecting to do social media, get them to inbox zero and maybe onboard new clients and and maybe handle a few sales calls. So it just becomes too much for one person. And so what you're better off doing is you're better- Are you aiming this at me? Are you looking at my own history as an entrepreneur and a business owner and just targeting my, this is, I get, I get how this is going to be. No, no, seriously. I think it is. You're, You're right. You're right. I've been there. I've done that. So keep on going. So, so, so what, what you should be doing is you should be dividing it up into smaller part-time jobs. Um, this is a really great opportunity because what's interesting is, is that most people are only super productive for four hours a day. So if you hire someone for 40 hours a week, you're not getting 40 hours of super productivity. You're getting four hours a day times five days. You're getting about 20 hours of super productivity. So the best thing to do is to, if you need someone to be doing, you know, admin work, inbox zero, you need someone to be be doing social media, you need someone to be doing sales call or onboarding new clients and such, is divide that up into three positions, three part-time positions, or even two part-time positions, because now you're going to be paying the same amount of money, but that person's only working four hours and they're going to work and get that productivity done in four hours. So you're actually going to get maximum productivity. You're going to get 40 hours by having two part-timers. And there is just such tremendous talent out there right now, especially since COVID um, kind of rocked our world and turned households upside down, especially households with children in school and such. And so there are plenty of, you know, professional, educated people out there um, who, you know, want to work what I call mother's hours and, um, and can work after school drop off and before pickup and really get that done for you in four hours. So that is number one, the biggest mistake and your solution on how to fix it. I think there's two groups of people who are, who are listening right now. Those who are saying, yep, been there, done that, just like me. And those who are thinking, nah, I wouldn't do that. And hopefully those who are saying, nah, I wouldn't do that. Let me just encourage you. Wisdom is learning from the mistakes of others. And there is such a temptation. I know because when I started doing what I'm doing now, three years ago, I tried to hire that person. Every single thing I wrote a list and every single thing. And I tried to find that unicorn and it didn't work. And then I narrowed it down and did exactly what you're talking about. So I think that's fantastic wisdom 
that I would encourage anybody who's trying to think about something new or even within your own business or in your company that you work for, try to find that role. Well, before we continue this conversation, who are you, Danielle? Yeah. And what is the experience that you have and what makes you qualified to really help us in this area? Sure. Well, um, I started my first business at the ripe old age of 25 and, um, it was an advertising and marketing agency in Nashville. We were doing over a million dollars in our first year. And, um, my brilliant out of the gate newbie hiring strategy of a 25 year old was to hire people younger than me. (laughs) Um, and I really kind of lucked out. Um, my first few hires were great. And then, uh, my luck ran out and I hired someone who, um, you know, following my same strategy, um, it was someone who was younger than me, um, someone who I went to college with, um, his sister, he was a fraternity brother with one of my other employees. So there was familiarity there and such, she was kind of like within the circle. So like I hired him and, uh, you know, a few, I don't know how long it was into him being there, but I woke up one Monday morning and I said to myself, Oh, can I call in sick, fake sick to my own company? Like I didn't want to go in. I didn't want to deal with another week of this individual. And, um, you know, that was my aha that I needed to fix this. Like I, I, I needed to put a stop to it and I needed to get serious and understand how to recruit and hire people because we were growing and I knew my strategy clearly wasn't going to work for the long term in scaling the business. And so at that point, I really dove into, you know, what does it take? And I became a student and, and just studied and, and have put into practice for now. 25 years almost, um, how to recruit, hire, and retain five-star employees. And, um, and kind of the testament to that is, you know, my husband and I have several businesses. They do over $50 million a year in, uh, in revenue, but I only have to spend about 10 hours a week overseeing the operations of those businesses because we have five-star employees who are in the business, doing the work in the business. And, you know, my 10 hours a week is leading the daily, um, uh, vitamin C meetings of those, of those, uh, teams, uh, also referred to as a daily huddle, probably, um, to some other people out there, we call it a vitamin C and, um, and, and just being there and being supportive. And then, you know, I spend the rest of my time kind of being strategic on the business. Um, I have a, a startup here. I have a podcast. I, you know, I kind of do other fun things in the entrepreneurial space, um, because having five-star employees has given me the freedom to really kind of, kind of go into my passion zone here and, those other businesses, you know, bring in a, a good living. Yeah. So, so someone's driving down the road right now. They're sitting at the desk. They're watching YouTube. They're kind of perusing this right here. And so here's what I want our audience to be thinking about. First of all, thank you for tuning in. So glad that you're part of this right here. Make sure to like, subscribe, share, comment, all those things. But think about this. What kind of employee are you? And just a question, a second, I'm going to ask the question, what is a five-star employee? But as you're listening to this in this moment, watching this in this moment, what kind of employee are you? And maybe you don't have anybody that you lead at this point in time. So let's start with the one person that you always lead and you're ultimately responsible to yourself. So what kind of employee are you? There's been times I've been a five-star employee. There's been times where I've been a one-star, maybe, maybe even a zero-star employee as well. So let's be real about that. Be real and honest with yourself. And then two, if you were to lead, who would you be hiring? What would you, what would your philosophy be if you are hiring? What is your philosophy? And then three, if you have people that you lead, what kind of employee are they? What kind of rating would they be? So let's start out with that first question though, Danielle. What is, according to your, you have a book on this and it's something that you think about a lot and it's your history. What is a five-star employee? Sure. A five-star employee represents the top 15% of available talent in the market for the role. Um, So that means it's a kind of a numbers game. One out of seven candidates is a potential five-star employee. So, you know, kind of a hiring mistake that a lot of businesses do is, is they don't have a, they don't cast a very wide net. So they end up with a small applicant pool. They've got like three candidates to pick from or four candidates to pick from. Well, statistically, if you only have three or four, you haven't hit that magic number of, of seven. So you likely don't have a, a, a five-star 
candidate in that pool of three or four. So you really kind of need, you know, a pool of 21 candidates to get three potential five-star employees um, because you don't want to settle. But you you brought up a great point too about like, you know, what kind of employee are you? And, you know, what's funny is, is and, and I say this all the time, I could get hired as a bookkeeper tomorrow. I could get a job as a bookkeeper tomorrow, but I would be a two-star bookkeeper. So just because someone might not be a five-star for the role, I'd be a two-star bookkeeper. I'm a five-star entrepreneur. Let me tell you, the, the rating is based off of the, the qualities, the skills, the aptitudes, lots of things, and it's specific to the role, whether that individual is a five-star employee for that role or not. So, so we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves if we look at ourselves right now and go, man, if I'm being honest with myself, I'm a, I'm a two-star. In fact, let's take a little turn right here. If people are listening and thinking, if I'm honest with myself in this management position, this leadership position, this corporate position, this whatever position that they're in, if they look at themselves right now and they're seeing themselves as a two or three, what would you tell them? I would say that you're in the wrong role because if you're if you're a two or three star and you and you really feel that way, then you're not working in your zone of genius. Um, you're doing something just like I can do bookkeeping. I know enough to be dangerous, but I mean, I would hate it. I would be miserable. I would procrastinate on it, et cetera. And so that's what would give me a two or three star rating. But you bring up a really good point too. You know, in our five star employee rating system, um, you know, we've got 11 qualities of a five star employee. There's, um, you know, over 25 aptitudes. Um, and, and, and so, in, you, you decide what you need, like what are the important aptitudes based off the role and such? And then what does that person need to score a minimum of in order for you to say, yes, like they've got this aptitude. Do they need to score a three? Like do they just kind of need to be okay at this or do they need to be a four? Or do they need to be a five? Um, and what's funny is, is when we take entrepreneurs through this process of, you know, customizing their, um, recruitment and hiring assets and creating like a good solid interview packet where they can actually objectively, uh, you know, assess uh, a candidate on the aptitude skills and qualities. You know, they, they often say, oh, they need to be a five and five and five and five and five. And I'm like, really? Like, are you a five and everything? You're not. So it, it, it's, it's, there's, there's a bit of bringing expectations to a realistic point. You want to set people up for success. And just like we talked about earlier, you know, when you create this job where you're looking for a sparkly rainbow unicorn, it, it doesn't exist. So it's important to be realistic about, about your expectations. Um, it, when, when you really are looking at what exactly do I need this person to do? What do I need them to be fantastic at? And what do I need them to be like, okay, average at? You're, they're not going to be fantastic at every single, single aspect because you aren't, we yeah. aren't, I'm not. And I love that you have, you, there's a guide in this and you have a book about this as well. And in that, of course, you, there's some aptitudes that you can go through. It, it would be very good for people to create some of their own aptitudes. What, what are they looking for? You know, sometimes we, all we know is we're looking for someone who wasn't like the last person. Exactly. That's a good place to start. That really is a good place to start because you probably, you probably didn't realize that you didn't want that when you hired that person. So success leaves clues, failure leave clues. So, you know, sometimes a good place to start with this is, oh my gosh, how do I not let that happen again? I don't want this. And then that leads you towards, you know, I don't want, and therefore what I want, which then brings it to the point of you can never settle when you are, you know, um, recruiting and hiring, um, you don't want to settle for less than a five-star employee for obvious reasons. Okay. So, so let me take you back to a moment where, where I learned a lesson and I'm going to get your advice though, from what I should have done in this moment, because I was in my young twenties and I became executive director and we were growing and I needed to hire someone. So I took one of my executive team with me. We went down and we set up something like seven interviews in a day. Okay. And we had a checklist because we knew what we wanted. We have this, 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 and a very specific sitting down. We both had it. We're going through and we narrowed it down to two people, offered two people to do some follow-ups. Mind you, we've already done some of the preliminary stuff on the phone calls and stuff before Zoom and all that. And, and 
we we then had two people come out, meet with us, do that whole thing. And then we narrowed it down to one. This is the person. We've gone all this way. We put the money in. We brought them out, done all that kind of stuff. We offered them the position. They say no. Yeah. Okay. Talk to me about those kind of situations. What should you do when you find the 15% and you think that they're going to go for it? And then they say no. So you, that's why we cast a wide net and that's why we, you know, get a lot of applicants. So we don't feel desperate. So at that point, you know, you got to the end and you had what you thought was the five-star candidate who then said no. And, you know, obviously the other person at, you know, just kind of like, didn't quite meet that five-star rating necessarily. And then you kind of really didn't have anything else in the pipeline. So it's important to keep the pipeline going. Um, and, and, and because I believe in free will. I believe that, you know, people can come and go, um, you know, people who take a job with me, if they find something better, if they need to move for their family, for whatever reason, like great, awesome. You have free will, but I also view it gives me free will to let people go if I, if I need to let people go and such. So, so I operate with that kind of mindset. And so I'm always just, you know, having as, as big of a, as a big of a pipeline as possible. I don't know the reasons exactly why they said no. So there could be again, some, some clues there as to, you know, what could have changed or what could be made better in your, um, in your process. Um, maybe they just, you know, I don't, I don't know what that specific reason was, but, um, you know, we've taken people through. So in our recruitment and hiring process, um, we start with, um, they apply online, they take an assessment within 24 hours. It scores them against a benchmark for that role. If they score 70% or higher, they move on. So right there, we are eliminating, you know, the obvious one, two, and three star candidates. And then, um, then we typically do, depending upon the position and the company, um, a screening interview. Um, then they do some testing. Uh, we're assessing their skills. Um, then we'll do a deep dive interview. After the deep dive interview, we will um, invite them in to do a shadow day. And um, we have had people come in on shadow day and say, yes, you know, I'm so excited. And then at the end of shadow day say, you know what, this is not the position for me. <laughs> and it's like, that's okay. Because I, I, I've, I still have people in my pipeline. I'm still working my pipeline. I still have that add up. I'm still trying to find candidates because the other thing too, is, you know, I mean, um, I don't know how to say this, like we made a hire recently, um, of someone who was, you know, further in the pipeline um, than the person that we ended up hiring. So this person was kind of behind in the pipeline. But when I looked at their resume, I was like, you know, like they'd be perfect for this position that we were going to post in May. It's the end of March. We probably could move it up a bit and such. So, you know, like it's good to just always have a, a pipeline of candidates or, you know, put some, put people on your virtual bench. I'm about 40% of my local hires, um, like within, you know, the geographic area that I live in or where we have physical offices, uh, you know, those, those people come from my virtual bench, people I've experienced in the market, people that have been vendors or, or clients or just people I know and have experienced their work ethic and how they do things, how they think and such, um, are on my virtual bench. And so a lot of times, you know, we, we bring people through, um, through, through the virtual bench path, but they still go through the process. They still take yeah. the assessment. They still do the shadow day. They still go through the interview. Yeah. If I'm going back in time and looking at it, probably the, I started with a large pool, but then I eliminated and I didn't keep on adding because I was already this far ahead. I'm not yeah. going to keep on Very common. Mm -hmm. And, and then I had to start all over. In fact, actually yeah. what we ended up doing was we decided to reorganize and that if we could reorganize in the right way, we could actually move some people over and really put this five-star person in this role. Now you hit something on about some two stars and such and getting rid of people who are two stars in the process, mm -hmm. but does a two-star employee always have to be a two-star employee? A two-star employee is a two-star for that role. So again, I'm a two-star bookkeeper, but I'm not a two-star entrepreneur. I'm a five-star entrepreneur. So, so someone isn't necessarily um, just kind of stuck in that. Now I will say 
that we do as part of our five-star rating system, one of the stars is the 11 qualities of a five-star employee. So we've identified 11 universal qualities that are just really key to being a five-star employee. Now- hit, hit some of those for us. Sure. Um, so actually uh, some of them are coded red, which means they're very difficult to change. Um, those are two of them. Two are coded green and the rest are coded gray. The green ones are relatively easy to change. The gray ones just, you know, they change, but they can change them, but they'll require, you know, the, their hiring manager or, or their supervisor to kind of be coaching them along to help improve that quality in them. So for example, two of the reds, there's only two, two reds are, um, limber being limber and listening. So if, if a person doesn't demonstrate, can't demonstrate that they're limber, they, they can't adapt to change. Got they it. can't pivot. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a red flag, especially for small businesses, because, yeah. you know, you're kind of going with the flow sometimes and, and, and you have to make strategic moves. And if you have a small team, everyone's got to make that move. So, so being limber would be a, a red flag and a deal breaker, especially working in an entrepreneurial organization. And then this as the second red quality, um, is, is listening. So if the, if the, if the person isn't an active listener, if they don't listen with all their senses and such, again, a deal breaker, because especially in an entrepreneurial company, you need people to be, um, you know, kind of paying attention at all times. Um, and, uh, so let me pause right there. So if sorry. people are listening right now, or if they're not listening, you just prove that you're actually not a five-star employee, but if you're listening right now and you're looking at yourself going, am I a good listener? Am I humble? Am I willing to, to learn? I love Patrick Lencioni talks about the three different things that you need to hire someone. One of them is that humble, that, that listening attitude right there. And then that limber, I like that, that adjustability. Are you someone who's adjustable? And would you say that really, no matter where you're at, if you don't have these two, you're realistically not a five-star employee? Most organizations need that. So, I mean, there could be positions. <laughs> so you're not going to say no, but. <laughs> well, I, I'm just saying like there, yeah. there, there could be there, there, I mean, there are positions where, you know, you, you do need someone to do the same tedious work day in, day out, and you don't need any change. You don't need any flexibility. Uh, you know, just someone who's very rigid. Um, in fact, I interviewed someone uh, in March uh, and I was about three and a half minutes into the interview and she was not answering the questions. She was, da -da 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 -da. and so I'm like, okay, wait a minute. She's not answering my question. Let me, let me, let me, let me ask some simple questions, see if we can get her. And, and at five, I gave her five and a half minutes and it was just like, she still wasn't answering the question. She wasn't listening to the question. She had like this agenda. I don't know where it was coming from. Um, and she wanted to deliver it. And so at five and a half minutes, I said, you know what? I don't think that, um, this is going to be the right position for you. And, um, so, you know, I just want to give you the rest of, of, of this time back and thank you so much. Um, I will say if I'm allowed to say, uh, you know, sh she did work for a state government. So <laughs> maybe, you know, that's that a, was, that was my mistake. Letting like trying to give her a chance. Sorry. <laughs> you might need to cut that out. <laughs> so if you work for the state government, don't, don't take offense. Those are Danielle's words <laughs> and you can find her at, no, just yeah, kidding. but, but, you know, like you can't, you know, that, that, that's, a, for example, that's a position where, you just have to do what you're told, right? Yeah. So, a, a lot on process here. If you're too, if you're too rating employee, there are going to be. I love that you got these eleven different things. We won't walk through all of them. I know you have a book, and I'll point them people to them as well, and people can check that out. But it would be a good. I always like to before I try to assess my leadership of others, mm -hmm. assess my leadership personally. You know, how good am I at this? How am I good am I at that? And that'd be a great thing for anybody to do, no matter what role you're at. If you want to advance yourself, you want to be limber and you want to be listening. So those are great areas. Let's let's talk about when we when we have one of those employees that they're consistently a two, they're not limber, they're not listening, they got some of the red flags there, and they have some other areas. How much time should we give an employee? to improve their performance before we just say out the door? I mean, it could be, it, it depends upon the situation, but it can be in as short as two weeks. I mean, when I hear someone say, um, you know, we'll give them six months, I'm just like, 
why nothing's going to change. Like we know what the inevitable is going to be. We don't need it to take six months. Um, and you know what, let's be honest, that person knows they're not doing well in the position, but we're creatures of comfort. So, you know, if we can show up to a place and people are relatively polite to us and we get a paycheck every other week, are we going to upset the apple cart? No, we're going to stay within our comfort zone and such. But let me tell you, someone who's not doing well in a position, they know they're not doing well in a position and, but, but they're in a comfortable spot. So you, to a certain degree have to make it a bit uncomfortable for them so that they're ready to move on and can move on quickly. But I can guarantee you, there is not one thing where someone has lost a position. I mean, I've been let go from a position, um, and you know, it hurts and it stings, but I am a million times better off now than if I would have just kind of continued muffling along in that position where, you know, I didn't love it, but, uh, I think that's a fantastic it, point. And we often think we're doing someone a service for keeping them on. I, I got hired one point in time and I was supposed to let some people go as part of my role. And so I led them down this path and realistically the people that I had to move off the team ended up in better spots for sure yeah. than they were in. For everyone, for everyone. Yeah, because and then because I let now they're go later. <laughs> that was because <laughs> because now they're doing something. You know, they moved on to something that they're better at, so yeah. they're going to be happier. They're going to be successful. So um, yeah. And the pay exactly. was great. There's a lot of fear that comes involved in all of this, and I, I love that. You know, I have a history of being in the Bible, and perfect love casts out fear. And one of the things that we think if we truly love the person, want the best for them, trying to keep them when it's miserable for us, miserable for them is not love. Yeah. But if we really think, hey, how can I love this person? How can I do this well for them? Then it should move that that fear aside for that. Absolutely. Can I add a bonus right there too? Yeah, absolutely. Like so, so, so you also can't pay for performance. You can't say, well, that. if I pay them $10,000 more a year, maybe they'll do better. No, Why not? because Why they not? don't, Be- because they don't have the aptitudes and skills to begin with. They don't but, have but the qualities maybe, that are needed. Maybe they're underperforming because they're just underpaid. Well, that's not a five-star employee. That's someone <laughs> who's, that's someone who's not all in, you know, I mean, they shouldn't have taken the job. I, I've had people. So, so I had a candidate, um, you know, I was recruiting, um, for a small business blog editor and community curator. And it was a part-time position, pretty flexible. So, you know, for some people it was going to be like a a side hustle and such. And I had one candidate, um, you know, she went through the process and, um, and she had completed testing and, and was, you know, pretty far along in the process. And then she said, Um, I gave her like another assignment and I pay for people to do the assignments and such. And she emailed me back. She's like, Oh, you know, um, I really want this position. And, um, I think like I I'd be awesome and I would really love to work for you and such, but I'm worth more than, um, than, than $20 an hour. I I need to be making like 27 or $28 an hour. And like from the get-go, I am a, I am a proponent for me, for my positions, for my companies, I'm very transparent. I put how much you pay, how much you get paid, um, in the job posting. I am typically high. I would typically like to hire entry level, clean slates, people I can train and such. Um, and you know, I said to her, I was like, okay, I, I, you know what, I know that you are worth 27 or $28 an hour, but this position pays $20 an hour. Mm-hmm. I I mean, I had plenty of people in my applicant pool. I didn't need to, I didn't need to go down to that. So, you know, she self-eliminated herself. She would, and it's good that, that, that all came out. Um, we hired someone, um, gosh, this was about 10 years ago in, um, in our Indiana office where we process long-term care claims. And, um, the person, um, was like, after a week of training came and said, you know, I'm bilingual. Um, and I think I should be getting paid more because I'm bilingual. And it's like, this job is 100% in English does not require any bilingual skills. Uh, and you know, I'm sorry, but like, this is the position you applied for. This is, was all stated and such. And, you know, we made at that decision at that point, to continue putting her through another four weeks of training, 
she's never going to be happy. She thinks she's worth more. So at that point we said, well, this probably isn't the position for you. So thank you. But, um, we're going to let you go. Let's continue to talk about money here, because I think that's a big issue right now. There's a job market. It's, it's, it's hot in some areas, it's cold in some areas. There's a great resignation over the last year. Everybody's moving around. And, and so let's, let's talk about money and what's the role that it plays in it and what kind of, what kind of loyalty should we have yeah. to, to jobs? Uh, for example, and this is, I, I hired someone, I posted a job at uh, just something very low. It was just going to be like a 10 hour virtual assistant in the United States. Mm-hmm. Someone applied and I actually said to that person, Hey, you're valued more than this. And her name's MA. She's fantastic. She actually did a podcast with me last year and worked with me for, for about a year. Fantastic. She applied. I said, you're worth more than this. I'd already done the whole admin thing where you hired somebody Mm -hmm. to try everything. And so I said, how about we just do this? And I gave her specific hours, specific tasks, very focused, kind of like what you're talking about. And she nailed it out of the park. And she learns so much in the time that we're working together that at the end of a year, it came to it. And realistically, I couldn't afford to pay her what she was worth. Mm-hmm. And so we, we sent her on our way. It was fantastic. And we have a relationship still and absolutely fantastic. Speaking to situations like this, where yeah. when should you pay more? What, what kind of situation are people finding themselves in and hiring managers and such? Yeah. You know, I mean, before we, before we, you know, if we, if we have a new position and we've never had that position before, um, or, you know, it's been a while since we've recruited for a position. Um, I always do a market analysis. Um, I mean, there's plenty of, of, of decent salary, uh, platforms out there where you can see, you know, how much are, are people getting paid in this market for this job? And I typically like to be towards the higher end. Um, and, uh, just kind of feel like that's, that's a good point. That's where people are going to feel like they're valued and, and things are good. Um, but I will tell you that, you know, we hired someone, um, recently and she's a recent college graduate. She had been working, um, in a library. She hadn't really kind of found a, a professional job with her, with her major. Um, and we hired her, we recruited her at $20 an hour. Um, and, uh, we like within two months gave her a raise because she was that good. And, you know, and, and she was bringing that, that value. I mean, we gave her a $5 raise. She's, you know, $25 an hour now, which is a big deal to someone like that, but it was because we were getting a return. So you're just setting me all this wonderful stuff up for the five-star employee rating system. So it's really important. So let me just kind of go through really quickly, and then we'll get the last two stars that hit on this. So the first star in the five-star employee rating system is make sure there's alignment in core values. The second star is the 11 qualities of a five-star employee. The third star are the aptitudes and skills needed for the role. The fourth star is uh, success metrics. So you should have three to five key responsibilities by role for that position. And you should have success metrics associated that are quantified success metrics. So there's a dollar sign, there's a number involved in terms of what success means for that key responsibility. So for example, if you have someone that um, is onboarding clients and that's how they spend, you know, that's one of their key responsibilities is onboarding five new clients a week, then, you know, a success metric would be that, um, that, that they get, um, a, you know, a five-star rating on the, um, onboarding experience survey from at least 50% of the onboarding clients. Um, so, so that is what measuring success is. And, you know, that, that is a driver to your revenue because, you want to, when you bring on a client, you want to onboard them as quickly as possible because when you onboard them, they have a good experience. They start using it. Now you've got a, a, a recurring customer for life, hopefully. Um, and then the fifth star in the five-star employee rating system is return on payroll. So ideally you should be getting a three X to four X return on an employee's salary towards revenue. So if you're paying someone $50,000 a year, they should be, their key responsibilities should be driving $150,000 
in revenue to the company per year to a, to 200,000. So three Xing or four Xing the, the salary. So, you know, everything should be very, very intentional. Um, and, and it should be contributing, um, to, to revenue and not just busy work. This is what I love about what you're doing here is it's, it's very tied to numbers and not just feelings. And a lot of hiring is, is emotional. Yeah. Very. And here's a way to take emotional and turn it towards, yeah, there's still going to be an emotional element because we're people. There's mm-hmm. still going to be a relational element. And there's obviously some stars that probably relate to those. Even the listening is a relational technique, a relational skill that we have. Uh, this is so good. And, and I, I think I'm going to pause right here because one, I'm actually going to go pick up my son here soon. <laughs> and and uh, it's summertime and we have camps. And amazingly, we've already done our, our 30 plus minutes in this interview. So it's amazing that this has gone so fast. And I believe that that's what's happened to our listeners going, oh man, this is it's, my drive's already done. My walk's already done. But what that means for you as you listen, as you watch us, is you need to check out more of what Danielle Mulvey is doing. So Danielle, where can people find you? you've you've really given us a taste and appetizer for the main course so talk to us about where people can find you and what you do yeah so i just go to five star employees.com the number five star employees.com perfect and that's danielle mulvey and of course we'll put some different things in the show notes the youtube notes and we'll we'll send it out there on our social media platforms as well for people to check out danielle this has been a a lot in a little, and I feel like we could go for another half hour very easily, but this has been absolutely great to have you on here. Is there anything else that you want to leave our listeners and our viewers before we wrap up? Oh my gosh. Yes. Never settle. Just never settle. Um, Don't get desperate. Never settle for less than a five-star employee. What if you are in a job? If you're, if you're in a job, never settle, like find, find, find the organization where you're in alignment with that organization's true core values, because that will, that will, that will start to bring the happiness that you might be missing in your current position. And, and can I add, don't do that every two months because <laughs> it doesn't look good and no one's going yeah, to, no, no, no. you. You, you definitely want to, you want, you want to suck it up and stick it out for at least two years, but, but be careful about, you know, if, if you're not sure, like ask to do a shadow day, you know, ask to spend yeah. four hours with them. That'll make you stand out as a candidate too. So fantastic. Danielle, this is great. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate you being on here today. Thanks, Mike. It was so much fun. And to all of our listeners and our viewers, thank you for being a part of the audience. We're adding value to your life, helping you advance in your career. So take a moment, like, subscribe, share, comment. And until next time, this has been Mike Acker from Advance with Danielle Mulvey. Thanks for listening to Advance with Mike Acker, a podcast designed to provide an edge for leaders through improving practical leadership skills and increasing confidence in speaking. Mike is a best-selling author and business owner who has helped many leaders increase their skills and their confidence, propelling them to new heights in their personal and professional endeavors. Join an incredible group of professionals taking the steps to become better leaders at connect.stepstoadvance.com. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode.